So welcome everyone to a fusion of flavors, a cultural footprint of what we eat and don't eat. My name is Vanessa Mukebi. Um, <laughs> I work at ReFed um, and it is my delight to welcome you to this panel as a food anthropologist um, and a communication specialist who focuses and is obsessed with ensuring that we make the best use of the food we grow, it is so vital that we have conversations to understand why, what we eat, how we eat, where we eat, why we eat, is often dictated by our social and cultural contexts and experiences and backgrounds. And with that, I am beyond thrilled and honored to welcome our distinguished panelists to the stage but I'll hand it over to our moderator, Alex Askew, who is the president of BCA Global, also known as Black Culinarian Association. All right. Well, thank you for coming and being here. Uh, this is a very, very personal subject to me when we start talking about tradition and food culture. Um, Myself personally, uh, as the founder of BCA, which was the first organization in this country around culinary diversity 40 years ago, um, and the fight still continues. It's, it's not even a fight sometimes making progress. It's just holding off you know, the incoming of what is trying to decimate and um, really take away parts of history uh, in terms of food that are so important, so important for communities. This is, um, again, such a sensitive subject. I'd like to get everyone kind of tuned in. You know, I don't, I don't see anyone on, on laptops. Usually when I start speaking, I see them closing because everyone knows that uh, it's about time to get real. But um, I just want to do a short little exercise. Some might feel it's a little hokey pokey, but I have a, a, a mindfulness background and um, actually mindfulness has is, is really helped me get more in tune with our work. And um, with that said, is it okay if we just do a small little mindfulness exercise to kind of tune in, there's so much energy in this room, is that all right? Any, everyone feel comfortable? So, um, it's very simple. If you choose to, just close your eyes. And I want to start by taking a very deep breath. And exhaling. One more. And exhaling. I want us now to tune in on our inner thoughts and feelings with intention around gratitude. Gratitude, appreciation is such an important aspect of life. And the first thing I want us to think about is the gratitude that we should have for this space which is almost a sacred space to talk about food tradition and food culture. And I just want us to think about that for a few seconds. The gratitude of this space and all those in this space, this space in a larger space within a conference. I want us to also think about gratitude for our ancestors. They may not be here physically, but I am sure if they're invited into this space, they will show up. And a big part of this conversation has to do with our ancestors because they established tradition and food cultural tradition as we know it, as we've learned it from our mothers and fathers and their mothers and fathers, and it might be aunts and uncles. But I want to, for all of us to think about that gratitude for our ancestors. I 
I also want us to think about gratitude for all those in the food system. We hear talking about food waste, but we must understand it starts as a seed that is planted, that people cultivate and care for, it, the people that harvest it, the people that transport it, the people that process it, the people that care about this great energy before we put it into our bodies. All of those along the food system journey and path I'd like us to think about gratitude for them. And lastly, I want us to think about gratitude for ourselves, for we are here because we have committed to be leaders in social change, leaders to uplift communities, leaders to address food waste which is such a travesty with so many people going hungry and yet we are committed with accountability to be leaders in this space. And for that, we should have gratitude for ourselves and those that are like-minded. Okay. Ah, well, I feel better. <laughs> Fell asleep, Phil? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. You know, when I first started meditating, um, I used to just fall off of chairs because my body wasn't used to for me being relaxed, and it just knew automatically to, uh, to fall asleep. Um, I just want to frame some of the touch points. We're not going to get through all of them, but I think this is a great start of a larger conversation. We're not gonna be able to, in one hour, um, even get to scratch the full surface. But um, I do want to talk about some of the touch points that uh, we will go over and, and um, my esteemed panelists here will talk about in more detail. First, I wanna talk about the importance of uh, cultural, food cultural relevance in our food system. It's critical, it's crucial. It impacts individual well-being. It creates community cohesion. And it's really the basis for broader societal outcomes. There are several different areas that are touch points to this that I want everyone to kind of realize and, and, and understand in context as we go through this panel. Uh, one is, you know, absolutely the health and nutrition of communities. Cultural relevant foods align with traditional dietary practices. They've been developed over centuries. This is not something that happens overnight. And um, it's really the essence for well-being in communities. Uh, this is kind of why some of the health programs don't work. It's because people um, in the medical space show up into communities and they start dictating what people should eat with no regard for their food cultural heritage. And then you wonder why it doesn't work. Well, there's, that's, a, that's what you call cultural insensitivity. There is the issuance of acceptance. People are more likely to adhere to dietary recommendations um, that they are familiar with. Meeting people where they are, right? If you're going to introduce something that's you know, far away from their culture, try to introduce something that is familiar first. So at least there's a bridge, you know, of understanding. Then there's the heritage piece. And one of the key things so important about this is the preservation of tradition, food cultural tradition. I get calls all the time about our kids not being connected to our food culture. They think tomatoes, um, you know, uh, come from ketchup or ketchup. I mean, it's like, you know, they're totally disconnected. And I, I think that's 
one of the purposes of the small agricultural movements that are happening. Then there's the issuance of sense and belonging. People don't understand there's dignity when there is relevance to food cultural tradition. And quite frankly, that is incredibly important to the social cohesion and the social bonds. We talk about communities falling apart. Well, food actually is the essence of bringing people together. So obviously there's something terribly going wrong, not just with the food system, but how we're addressing this on a community level, which includes family meals, festivals, celebrations, and ultimately creating this intergenerational bond, right, which is the struggle right now because kids are always on the phone and we're fighting software apps and, <laughs> and uh, YouTube videos, right? Uh, I have an eight-year-old, so I know that very personally. Um, but how do we start thinking about the dots that need to be connected between food waste, food insecurity, food sovereignty, biodiversity, equity, and empowerment of our communities? And the answer is food. The answer is food. Um, I don't have many housekeeping rules. This is a safe and brave space, meaning that uh, we all respect each other's feelings, words, understandings, and the brave piece is about asking questions that ordinarily you'd be uncomfortable to ask. I assure you, these panelists will not be afraid to answer them. I guarantee you that. And um, I also want to welcome everyone that supports diversity and equity, but also, also acknowledge all of the allies and accomplices of all colors understanding this work is important because we must have allies in the work. I say we must have accomplices. The difference being that an ally is not going to rob a bank with you, but an accomplice will. <laughs> so now to our panelists, I'd like to do something a little bit different because they're going to introduce themselves. Um, but what I like to do is read each a panelist's name, you give them a round of applause, and then we'll do a round robin so you can get to know them on a personal level. So I'd like to welcome, and I'm so honored, I got to know each and every one of you so closely, uh, Sean Cuffey Young, Jill Conklin, Phil Acosta, and June Lee Joe. Let's give them a round of applause. These are my accomplices. All right, so um, two-part question, round robin. Uh, anyone can start first. Uh, tell us about your personal mission statement. That's the A part. And what does food waste mean in your own culture for the populations you serve? Anyone, anyone, anyone can go first. So my name is June Jo Lee, and I, th I think it might be helpful for them to know a little bit of our context, our lens. So my lens is uh, cultural anthropology and consumer research. I studied medical and food anthropology, and my, um, my culture that I study is consumer culture. <laughs> I study consumer culture. And so um, earlier in my career, I was uh, helping brands and retailers and um, food service, uh, helping them sell more food, uh, bigger shopping carts, gain um, bigger stomach share. And now my work is different. I do cohort-based research um, to understand where there's caring more, connecting deeper, and curing the myths that keep us apart. So I work with leaders who are courageous enough and determined to rewrite menus, to remake worlds. And so that is my work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Phil? Thanks, June. And thanks, Alex. Um, I, 
I guess I'll answer that by introducing myself as well and offer up the, the lens that I come into this space. Mm -hmm. um, so I offer the perspective from an immigrant that came into this country, uh, someone that has lived in poverty, um, relying on social services to get by. Um, I also offer up the perspective of a solution provider, uh, uh, hoping to nourish uh, the underserved communities, uh, mostly made up of immigrants like myself, uh, people of color. Um, so I've seen and lived both ends of the spectrum. Um, growing up in a household, um, nothing went to waste. Uh, mm. So this, when this whole food waste concept, uh, growing, growing into it was very foreign to me. Um, growing up poor, we cherished what little we had uh, we reused everything, we recycled everything, mm -hmm. we upcycled. And so I um, also grew up in a farm, grew some vegetables, literally putting food on the table. So we lived sustainably before sustainable, uh, sustainability mm -hmm. was a buzzword. Um, and that's coming from me and my culture. So, you know, as a result, you know, creating a nourishing, uh, equitable and regenerative food system has been ingrained in me as a person, uh, in my work and in my life. Thank you. Sean. Hello, everyone. Uh, so in order to understand my perspective, so first off, when I get very excited, I really delve into my trininess. <laughs> so you may hear my dialect come out. Don't worry, it is still the English language. It's just going to sound a little bit different, right? Um, but to also understand um, my perspective and where I come from, um, I wanted to share why doing this work is important to me. Uh, so my personal mission statement is actually to transform the way you think and act towards waste. Um, but that started all the way back in my childhood. So I'm going to ask you guys to participate in a little interaction with me, okay? So... I want you to think of your favorite childhood place. And so where did you go to play? Where did you go to relax? Where did you go to have the most fun? So yell out some of those places to me now. So what's, what was your favorite childhood place? The swimming pool. The swimming pool. Swimming pool. The backyard. The backyard. backyard. Swings. Mm -hmm. Playground. Garden. Excellent. Excellent. The kitchen. where? Kitchen. The kitchen. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, so my favorite place at home is the beach. Mm. Rightfully so, right? Um, and so while swimming with my dad at the beach when I was 11 years old, a loaded diaper struck me in my face. Ooh. Okay. Why was that nice? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it served as a light bulb moment for me. Two things happened. One, I told my daddy never to take us back there again, which my 11-year-old <laughs> self was very grateful because daddy actually listened to 11-year-old me. Um, but it really drove me to want to do something different, even at that age. And fast forward to July of 2015, where I founded um, Sile Environmental, which is a for-profit social enterprise based in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, where we specialize in waste education and consultancy. And I've been working in the waste management space for almost 20 years. I don't look it, do I? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> um, and so my background, I'm an environmental scientist by training. And that colors everything, but my, I married what I've learned from my parents. My father's a retired teacher, so I love teaching. I actually taught high school physics. And I also married my mom's love of people because she's a retired social worker. Mm. Um, and plus put all of those things together with my love of waste. I have a saying at home, people know me at home for saying waste is sexy. And food waste is even sexier. <laughs> so um, that really colors the perspective, having worked for the only state waste company for a number of years, and now running my own enterprise, working with children and youth, 
young people. I feel like I was telling someone at breakfast, like I do everything from children all the way up to adults, working with businesses, corporate entities, with SMEs, because the work simply needs to be done and I'm not one to sit back and wait for something to happen. So that colors my perspective and why I'm in the food waste space. All right. I so love that you connected yourself to your family and community. Um, so much for myself as well. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to share with us. Um, I just want to sit with Alex, your gratitude, because this opportunity, thank you, Vanessa, has gotten a chance for me to meet five, six <laughs> wonderful people um, who have opened my eyes and given me perspective to what food and culture looks like, both in terms of what they've shared here personally and in their work. Um, and I think that's an important thing that we all need to make space to listen and be sometimes in spaces that are foreign to us. It helps open our perspective and allows us to participate in conversations like this. Mm -hmm. um, I like to say food is consumed my life, <laughs> is consuming my life. Um, my, uh, my view on the food system is largely based on how food scarcity and food abundance um, has come in and out and flowed through my life. Um, as having um, dairy farming grandparents, a mom who literally preserved everything out of our garden and tried to use her amazing cooking skills to enhance foods supplemented by WIC, um, to my training as a executive chef and culinary educator, um, really focused on health, nutrition, and well-being, uh, to my current role at Food for Soul, a nonprofit international organization working at the intersection of um, food system sustainability and inclusivity. Um, that journey and each of my experiences, especially in my adult life, um, has also helped me nourish my passion for food and the relevancy of how we eat and how we consume into mm -hmm. your question around this idea of food consumption and culture. Food for Souls, an organization that was founded um, by Chef Massimo Bottura and his restaurant and life partner, Lara Gilmour. We come from a place in Modena, Italy, which is Emilia Romagna region, um, where food and culture go hand in hand. It's a place where some of you may have heard of Parmigiano Reggiano and balsamic vinegar, foods that are based in tradition, time, quality. We wait for those tastes and flavors to come forward and we taste a little drip of balsamic vinegar. We taste all of the hands and hours and knowledge in each of those drops. That experience, our connection not only to food and culture, but to land, food and land, um, is what has shaped our theory of change at Food for Soul, our approach in creating community spaces around the world. Um, and it's a, a constant uh, area of reflection we come back to each time we're working in different communities around the world to really stop and listen to how that community relates food and land and what is significant in terms of its culture before we begin to project mm -hmm. what we believe a healthy, inclusive, sustainable food system looks like. So happy to be here and mm -hmm. share. Thank you. Absolutely. What did I tell you about our panelists? Was I right? Um, so just a reminder, we're going to have a few minutes for some Q&A. Uh, I'll announce it, and so to kind of be efficient, we'll have people kind of line up next to the microphone so we can kind of be really kind of tight around our time. Um, and I also want to mention that um, reach out uh, to any and all of the panelists on a more personal level. We're just not even scratching the surface with this subject because it's so immense, and I'm sure uh, they will you know, generously reply with information and, and presentations um, because, you know, because of time we weren't able to kind of put it all in. So let's get to it. 
Remember, these questions were very intentional, and uh, we're about to take a deep dive. So, um, you know, try to uh, put on your seatbelt, all right, as we go in. So, let's do it. First question is for Sean. Let's talk about the power of language. In the Caribbean, and from your experience, what role does culture play in contextualizing what food waste is and how we solve it? What's a loaded question? That <laughs> is, uh, but the simple answer is that culture is everything to us mm. in the Caribbean region. It is who we are mm. as people. We're a very, very small but proud bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere we go, you know, it is, it, it goes before us. It is in how we eat. It is in how we prepare food. It is how we show up in the world. It means the world to all of us. And food waste is the number one waste type that is generated, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the Caribbean region. And uh, this excludes Latin America, because oftentimes we get lumped together mm -hmm. when I'm talking about the English-speaking, French-speaking, Spanish-speaking Caribbean islands, right? So, but culture also is colored by, and this is why Alex said this is a safe space, because I'm going to say things that are true. So, we were colonized by the British, by the Spanish, by the French, and so, with that process of colonization and slaves coming from different parts of the world, we had slaves from the west coast of Africa, we had indentured laborers from East India, we had workers coming from China, from Syria, Lebanon. Um, so our, I always say Trinidad and Tobago is like a beautiful mix of all of the different kinds of people. But because of that, it influences what we eat. And so all of these descendants, all of our ancestors, left with us their food that we just decided to throw in our own locally available spices, products, and made it uniquely Caribbean. So for us, uh, we have Pelau, which is what we call it in Trinidad. In Jamaica, you'll hear rice and peas. In our next country is another name, but it's the relatively the same dish. Jamaica's national dish is aki and saltfish. Mm -hmm. In Trinidad, if you guys ever want to come, you must have a doubles. It is a vegetarian dish of which I am very happy because it's the one thing I could eat when I'm at home. <laughs> um, and it is, it's doubles because it's two patties filled with curried garbanzo beans, chickpeas. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have things like mango and char and cucumber spices and all of these things that we put in it. So we cannot do food waste work without integrating our culture, mm. integrating our language. Because we would, f we would have found that previous campaigns didn't work because it was not representative of who we are. So there are two campaigns. Um, so there's one at home that I... Um, I'm a part of called Das Good Thing. So in Trinidad, when something is good, we shorten, so our dialect shortens all the words, right? So Das means that is. <laughs> and we say ting, not thing, not, a, not with the TH. We drop the H, right? Um, and that just means if it's good, you shouldn't waste it because that's good thing. In Jamaica, they have, they have a campaign called Not Dirty Up Jamaica because they don't want anybody to leave the place clean. But those are two campaigns that are intrinsic to who we are as Caribbean people. And we found that when we take other campaigns from other parts of the world, they don't work. So if we were to take Love Food, Hate Waste from the UK, we have to make that uniquely Caribbean. Mm. Otherwise, it won't work. People watch us like... Okay, I know you're gonna hear my accent. Like, what are you doing that for? That don't make no sense. Y'all understand what I just said? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, a part of it is we need to be able to establish connection. We need to forge a love of place. We also have a saying that my grandparents used, or which is better belly bust than good food waste. 
So it's better you eat all your food than you waste anything. Your mm. belly has to bust, meaning you have to be filled, right? So we have to be able to use that in how we communicate our strategies, how we relate to people. Because uh, when we travel, we love hearing each other's accents. So that's how we connect. And another really important thing is using that to teach our children. Mm. So one of the things that I was able to do is I wrote a children's book. I have it right here. It's called Kai's Magical Adventures, Where the Garbage Goes. <laughs> and uh, my daughter, who's eight years old at the time, kept asking, Mommy, what happens to things after we throw it away? Am I supposed to throw away everything? And then recognizing that when I talked to children in schools, they had the same question. Mm. But I wanted to leave something long-lasting with them, so I wrote the book. And in that, we talk about uh, your fruits and vegetable scraps should be composted, or we talk about your plastic water bottle should be recycled, and only the things that need to go to the landfill, because landfilling is still our major method of disposal across the region. Only things that need to end up there should be there. And so storytelling is essential, incorporating who we are, using our language, communicating that clearly is what will help move our needle forward. Okay. Everyone get the taste of the islands there? <laughs> All right. Um, Alex, can I add a comment to that? Briefly. Yes, Go I'm, ahead. I'm not, no, no. <laughs> we'll get, I just want to make sure I'm the, yes. I'm, I'm the time czar here. Um, well, the next question is for you, Jill. From your experience at Food for Soul and setting up repertorials around the world, how does a cultural lens to food waste reduction enable and empower community building and social inclusion? Thank you, Alex. I'll come back to my other point. <laughs> no, um, many of you probably have never heard the term refetorio, so maybe I'll start there. Um, refetorio is a Latin, comes from a Latin word called reficere, uh, that means to remake or restore. And it is um, the first name of these community spaces that Food for Soul uh, creates, co creates, in collaboration with other nonprofit organizations working in their local communities in and around food. Not everybody is at the forefront of rescuing food. Many of our partners are providing culinary and job apprenticeship programs, providing food assistance, and uh, working across the food security space. Um, Refetorios, uh, for us, we consider them cultural projects. Um, we've always said we're not a charitable organization, we're a cultural organization. And in these community spaces, there's a social kitchen that's anchored and participates in both strengthening and improving and evolving the local food recovery network to divert food surpluses um, to feed people before landfill. Um, and in that process, these kitchens uh, receive imperfect surplus foods and transform them into meals. But the meals are not just provided to our community members as food aid. They're provided in the form of a multi-course meal that is served around a communal table. Mm -hmm. And the initial refectorio opened in a place where monks used to gather, break bread, share ideas. And it's really putting in the center of our communities, community spaces mm -hmm. that break apart the idea of building spaces just for needy people and just for charity but creating spaces that are inclusive and as an invitation to celebrate through food um, all of who we are and what our identity is. Um, these multi-course meals at the table give us an opportunity to also connect with our guests who are largely socially vulnerable with a wide variety of lived experiences and trauma and if you can think about going to a restaurant and having an experience from the time that you walk in the door, from the aesthetics and the material and the way that it feels welcoming, kind of a, a hug, uh, a, a bit of a gift for a respite, and then you sit at a table and a server comes and welcomes you and says hello and greets you as a person in a form of dignity and then comes back to share with you what's been prepared for you that's an offering. And in each of those courses, 
gets a chance to connect with you again. It's a form of trauma-informed care, of healing that can happen at the table. And so when we think about building these community spaces in collaboration, we spend a lot of time before building listening, working to host workshops and activities in which anybody that's coming to participate, whether they're coming to get something to eat or they're coming to volunteer or coming to support the program, can actually help us understand and learn and in, inform in our programming around the cultural identity of that community, what's missing, what's lacking. And then this shared table becomes a place in which we can continue to learn, continue to evolve. The aspect and the intersection of food waste um, is an in interesting term. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that food waste, it's like the death of food. We like to shift that language to wasting food, putting responsibility and accountability and action back into that. When we do that, we help ourselves stop and reflect and remember a little bit of what Phil was saying, that the idea of wasting food is not true for everybody around the world. It's not part of what Sean just expressed at all. And so we have to be careful when we decide to uh, continue our charitable work that these terms and the way we define our work uh, is, a, is, a, is creating new opportunities and a diversion of the issue. Um, and we, we have an opportunity when we look at food, how it's grown, how we consume it, how we share it, how we think about next generations to consider waste as a stream mm -hmm. within the supply chain. Um, each of us, the last thing I'd like to say is that each of us doing charitable work, coming from the solutions provision of services and communities, um, are always at risk of perpetuating a cycle of poverty. And sometimes we need to look at things such as food waste to understand and take action on why that waste happens in the first place. And so a big part of our work in receiving a donation from a company, from a donor, is to really deeply understand why there's so much overproduction in the first place. And so we are very happy that one day we could get to a place where we're socially and economically sharing the equity of our food, not just on the recipient donation side. All right. Ashe. <laughs> You've obviously went to a Baptist church. Oh. <laughs> um, Phil, you're next in line. Two-part question. Um, how does incorporating a cultural perspective into surplus food and redistribution ensure that the dignity, needs, sanctity, and consumption are upheld those facing food scarcity? That's a, that's a good one. Thanks, Alex. Um, I, I'll try to answer that in several different ways. Um, you know, from again, from my lens or in our culture, the relationship with food goes well beyond just simple consumption. Um, you know, it's such an intimate part of who we are, part of our family, part of our culture. Um, the relationship between the resource that we get from the land and the sea that's cherished. Uh, whether that's coming from uh, the Asian culture that I was born into or the Native Hawaiian and Polynesian culture that I grew up Whoa. in. Whoa. Bring the house down. Look at Whoa. that. <laughs> I was just oh. getting to the good part. <laughs> All right. We're going to do... Uh... Does everybody close their eyes and pretend. All right, go ahead, Phil. It happens. Okay. Are we good on power? There you go. It's coming back up. You were doing good. No. <laughs> Joe brought the house down. That's what it was. 
Um, no, as, as I was saying, just, you know, in, in the Asian culture that I was born into or the Polynesian culture that I grew up in, um, that relationship between um, nature, our aina, is, is very sacred. And so, you know, when we talk about food systems, it's not just about consumption. It mm. goes well beyond that. And oftentimes in, in food rescue and food redistribution, we don't talk about it, but we force feed people just, you know, what, what is in excess, or what is easily accessible. We don't like to talk about it, but this is part of our work. It is. Mm. And um, leftover foods or unwanted products, usually not um, part of a, a staple uh, diet of the people that we serve, often very unhealthy. Um, that leads to the growing problem of uh, health and nutrition, heart disease, hypertension, mm. diabetes. And counterintuitively, that adds to the problem of food waste because we're giving people food that they normally wouldn't eat. Mm. Um, so for us, you know, we started looking inward um, at our culture. We started looking at the people that we were trying to nourish, those who were growing and producing food. Um, we started to uh, incorporate staples of the local diet, uh, like rice, like kalo or um, taro. Um, we also reached out to um, local farmers, see what they had growing in the fields, see what they had in excess that wasn't being bought out uh, by the supermarkets. Uh, we looked at things like eggplant and okra and squash, things that are uncommon in your, in your food pantry, but very common at our table, but very common in our diet. Um, we also looked at um, local produce to help, uh, to help the uh, local farming community. We looked at um, ulu or breadfruit, uh, uwala, sweet potato, and working with local chefs to create recipe cards so that people receiving what we offered to them could actually utilize and maximize the food uh, that they, they're uh, getting and make something delicious and nourishing while minimizing the food waste. So th that was you know, really a complete shift for us for what we we're trying to do. We're not there. We're trying to incorporate these things. Um, you know, I, I, I would, um, I'll be honest and say it's not perfect. We still serve the unwanted things because that, that unfortunately is still part of um, the business model. But we're working towards being better and meeting the needs of the people that we serve. Um, so, yeah, I would say grow what will sustain the people in the earth, not just what's um, easily grown, what's um, profitable, and also focus on what people would actually eat mm -hmm. instead of just what's available or what's, um, you know, prescribed in a food box. Mm -hmm. um, really look, look inwards and evaluate um, the needs of the people that we're serving. Mm. Thank you, Phil. Sounds like you're meeting people where they are. That sounds like great work. Now, June. Hello. All right, um, we have a couple of things to unpack here. As a uh, ethnographer, can you discuss first, give someone, everyone a, a brief description of what that is, but can you discuss the importance of taking a human-centered lens to understanding and reshaping conversations around food and culture, particularly in the next generation of sustainability champions. Wow, so kitchen sink. Yeah, right now. kitchen sink. Okay. Um, so a food ethnographer for me is very simple. Um, we all eat, but have you considered that what we eat is more than taste, trends, and nutrition? Uh, it's part of a greater worldview. Um, that we call culture. And so for me, I mean, we just heard four very different lenses to eating. Um, I had a chance to talk to Phil deeper yesterday, and I'm so imp like moved by your approach, which I think is truly sacred, that we are food, food is us, and we are all one family, I think sacred nourishing, and, um, and Sean, you, I think, are talking from an uh, environmental lens, 
and we have two chefs uh, <laughs> from two very prestigious schools. And so you are both talking about it from uh, regeneration, restoration, and inclusivity and diversity. So we have so many different approaches, ideas, cultures mm -hmm. around food. And my job is to figure out what is it that we all share, mm -hmm. the patterns amongst all of us and all of us. And so um, I'm really focused on modern hungers. So let me just contextualize my work. I, I work in modern consumer culture. And in modern consumer culture, we have modern hungers. And these modern hungers really are about disconnection, extreme loneliness at times, even though we're hyper-connected, and dislocation, the sensation of being everywhere and nowhere. And I think technology, and um, technology has done a lot to it, as well as globalization, the fact that we've all are so well-traveled. 51% of Americans now have passports. Mm. So the majority, yeah, we're eager to connect uh, with each other. So when I think about modern hungers, I see three really high-level drivers. The first is um, our deepest needs for self-improvement. America is the country of self-improvement. We're constantly improving. So whether that is socioeconomic status or um, it, could be, uh, it could be weight management or optimizing our performance. We eat because we have certain beliefs um, about the kinds of foods and the way we should eat mm -hmm. that help us self-improve. So that's one big pattern that I look at. The second one is our most desperate desires for connection. Uh, we all want to connect with ourselves, with each other, with my family. And then the third is our dreams. I think many of us are here because we want to rewrite the menu and remake worlds. We have wild dreams of possibilities of what our world could be. Mm -hmm. And so those are, the, uh, for me, the main patterns that I look for. And one particular lens that I bring right now is uh, Generation Z, born 1997 to 2012. They are the first global youth uh, generation. And they are, the way they talk about food is unlike any other generation I've studied before. Yeah, you agree? Um, I love Gen Z, they are so awesome. There are hot sauce to tell us this isn't the finish line for them. You know, they've been growing up hearing all these stories about the sky falling. There's a clock in um, New, York New York that is counting down, mm -hmm. literally. And they're saying, hey, we're just at the beginning of our work life. Mm. Um, and so there are hot sauce. Mm -hmm. And they're carrying hot sauce in their backpacks to make bland, no change <coughs> food. Uh, you know, palatable. So I think for this generation, uh, no change, like dystopia is already here. It's not changing how we're doing things mm -hmm. currently. There also are kimchi. They're kimchi their way through our hot messes, all the hot messes that we created, mm -hmm. all the myths that keep us apart and create these silos. Um, and so, you know, they are fermenting, upcycling to more nourishing and delicious worlds. Mm -hmm. And so, really, I see them as mentors of new ways. Uh, if we think about power users, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I think about power users of the future, they are Gen Z and now Gen Alpha, who are truly the future. So, you know, we all talk about the future, and quite literally, if you want to taste the future, try a public school lunch. Square pizza, chocolate milk, with maybe a fruit cup, because it reveals what we're actually valuing and the complexities of modern food. And the way that how we eat is literally eating up our worlds. 
And I just wanted to share one last thing, which is um, how Gen Z are thinking about it. Waste hurts them. It, it like, it, they're expressing it as physical pain. It mm. hurts them because waste is a resource out of place and Gen Z's are resources. They're determined to find their place in well-functioning cultures and it's pretty hard right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's what I'm leaving the audience with today. Okay. Well, thank you. That was pretty deep. Um, Gen Z, I sit in a lot of financial meetings. I'm a co-trustee to an, uh, a trust, and that's all that we talk about is how Gen Z is, ex uh, is impacting the stock market. You know, how they're controlled. We got to get rid of these stocks and that stuff. All right. Anyone that has questions, we have about seven more minutes. So we're going to uh, get to it. Let's line up for the questions. Um, and then we're going to just in the interim, only one person? There's got to be more questions than that, please. I'm sure there are. Um, and we're going to do one more round robin. I, I just wanted to, I was remiss by not giving my personal mission statement. Um, and my personal mission statement is very simple. I just want to help people. I want to use all my education and extensive training and extensive fellowships and food systems leadership to connect the dots between food waste, hunger, food insecurity, sustainability, climate change, social determinants of health, all those dots that need to be connected so that we can um, uplift communities, but also really relieve anguish and pain and suffering. That's pretty much it. Pretty simple. Hard to do. All right. Round robin. You have about, nope, nope. This is first. All right. You, you only have 30 seconds each, and so we'll get right to it, but I wanted to put this in. What is one tangible action step everyone can do right now to make a difference? Go. You can all be food ethnographers. Start by, start by asking, what's your flavor of home? What makes you go, mm, you know? Uh, how are you learning to care more about food in your life? And listen to what's said and not said with great care, hyper self-awareness. And know that we all eat, so we all have the power to shape our futures. Great, great timing too. Phil. Um, I'll quickly add that, you know, I, I would focus on inclusion throughout your program design and your decision making. Look inwards at your team leadership at all levels. Um, I think having, making this space for, uh, to be, for those people to be seen and heard it really helps to shape, um, you know, the, the offerings that we have and really touches upon um, the cultural needs. Great. Joy? So, um, as a waste educator, um, my action step is that I want you guys to place the how higher than the what. Oftentimes we focus on giving people more information, but we don't pay enough attention to how that information gets to them and in what way it gets to them and are we incorporating their perspectives and what matters. Uh, because transformative waste education really starts from the inside out. Um, and so push beyond the norm because it is not always about doing things better, but sometimes we simply need to do better things. Ashe, Jill. Okay, after you do one, two, and three, repeat. One, two, and three. <laughs> That's what I would say. I echo each of them. Um, I'm going to say make visible the invisible. Why is a banana peel discarded in some parts of our world and in others roasted and bo boiled and roasted and made into a pasta carbonara that's vegetarian? Ask yourself. Dig into that inner child of discovery that used to hang out in all of where Sean asked you your favorite places are and work to reimagine as she said, it starts within us. Reimagine your own lives, and I really fundamentally believe that if we live that within ourselves, it bleeds into our communities, it bleeds into our workplaces. There's a lot of vulnerability that we are comfortable with when we're young. Let's continue to do that in our adult lives. Great. 
All right, questions. Uh oh. I can hear you, but we don't have a microphone. We need I can talk loud oh, too. Oh, <laughs> Lord, Lord, Lord. Okay. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm, uh, my name is Q Fagan, and I'm with the Future of Food, and uh, I want to just clarify what you said. Waste is a misplaced resource? Is that what you said? Yeah, I kind of took That's it That's a mic drop. I need that on a t-shirt. But <laughs> yeah, it's actually from um, Dick Lilly, who has been working in Seattle uh, waste management for many, many years, and that's where I heard it. Okay, so I do have a, a question. So my question is that uh, we primarily activate at South by Southwest, and we have a lot of uh, partnerships that are alternative proteins, you know, or lifestyle, like um, uh, vegetarianism, veganism, and whatnot. And it is just like this conference, predominantly Caucasian. And one of the things that I just haven't been able to truly articulate or convey is how important it is that they need to consider cultural influences with everything that they do. And even this, this should be on the main stage in my humble opinion. Mm, uh, right <laughs> that's my humble opinion. Uh, and so like when we're talking about food waste solutions and the city's talking about where it'll be located, if you don't have culture behind these movements, I feel like they're just gonna be a whole bunch of white people talking in a room. And I don't know how to, like, do you guys have any advice on, well, sorry, y'all, I just say what I gotta say, but uh, is there any, like, but I want it to be motivating. I'm not even saying this to be negative or bad. I mean, like, how do we get that across without it coming across that we're just trying to be woke or something? Uh, right. So any advice you have would be great. Oh, thank you for honoring the safe and brave space. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Q. I mean, I, I really appreciate the honesty, for real, for real. Um, so I 1,000% agree with you. I mean, even as somebody who's coming from a different country, like at breakfast yesterday, there was no tea. And we drink tea in the Caribbean. Um, and so even sometimes the, the things that people overlook, um, it really shouldn't, it should be a part of the conversation and the discussion. Um, so it is important for organizations like South by Southwest and other organizations to really incorporate, not just coming from a solutions perspective, but how are our attendees who come from different cultural backgrounds, how are they also going to feel safe, seen, valued, heard, mm -hmm in the same space, that is extremely, extremely important. Because oftentimes I find when we have these conversations, they're very surface level. And as an outsider looking in, you know, how can I, what would it, what would it have been like for me to even be warmly received? You know, mm. um, what, would I, what would that have looked like, felt like, sounded like? You know, I'm waiting, still waiting for Vanessa to play some soca music. But, um, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll work on that one, Vanessa, right? But um, culture has to be a part of every single discussion, conversation, conference. We can't continue to just meet things on a surface level without mm. delving deeper. Because we do bring ourselves to these events. And so we should be represented. Can I add just real quick, I think uh, one thing I worry about in this uh, global landscape around plant-based diets is that we are not thinking at all from a cultural perspective. Uh -uh. I want some yam and some cassava and, and some uh, breadfruit, right? right animal, right. Uh, you know, animal-based proteins play a, a, a very specific traditional role in so many native lands. So I think the point that you raise is really important. Our community of practice is around bringing as many diverse perspectives as possible and as many different disciplines together as possible because each sector is somewhere on that spectrum of pro progressiveness towards inclusivity and towards recognizing exactly what Sean said. 
And I think we, if we can embrace a community practice around that, we can slowly get better at listening and hearing and instituting that into our institutionalization of certain things like events, catering, et cetera. Okay, great. We have time for a few more questions if the questions are short and the answers are short. Okay. But I want to be able to, because I think they're important. Yes. So, um, <clears throat> Great panel, so happy to be here to be able to listen to it. Feel pretty lucky. Um, my question uh, for the panel is, uh, you know, I, I attend a lot of uh, food innovation conferences and, and I'm often hearing about time-saving technology or time-saving consumer packaged goods. Um, so you have to spend less time in the kitchen. But we know actually kids who grew up spending more time in the kitchen, they do better math, they have better reading mm -hmm. skills, they, they're healthier. Um, but I feel like uh, I'm part of this great homogenization machine and I don't actually have a food culture because I grew up on packaged foods. I grew up with the microwave, I grew up with all these things. So my question to the panel is, what's your advice to, and I think this is, is not uniquely American, I think it's, it, but especially American, but growing, this homogenization of culture. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and I think that there are a lot of people who, who really don't have a food culture. Um, what, what's, what do you say to, to folks who are, are searching for food culture? So Matthew Lang, I know that your partner is Italian, so I know your family has food culture. Well, she does. I know. She does. <laughs> she, and I'm jealous. I've got FOMO for her food culture. Well, <laughs> it's... It's your food culture now, and you live in the city of Davis that is rich with food culture, one of the best farmer's markets and a community You weren't supposed connected. to call me out, June Joe. Just, just come on, answer the question. But, but this is the truth of all of us, just like Sean said. We all come from someplace. We all have heritage. We just need, some of us need to start reconnecting with it. Um, some of us never were able to forget it. We never lost that disconnection. And there are a lot of people who lost that connection. And so we all have it. I don't believe it. Yeah, no, I, I, grew up on, on, I grew up on Rice Krispies and Wheat Thins, and that just does not lay a food culture, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, you could always get some friends. <laughs> I mean, that, that might be an option. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Go to all my friends. I'm, I'm asking about a, uh, uh, is there some kind of solution that we can let's you stop. Know, bring forth? I know what you're asking, but let's stop. Let's remove the abstraction. I mean, this whole panel is about specificity, and culture is really about getting close to relational uh, foods. So I, I think one thing we have to do is stop abstracting everything into time, price, fun, and uh, convenience. All right. Next question, please. Hey, thanks for making time for me. Um, I'm Can you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm Amanda from Oklahoma. Um, Y'all are doing it up there, and I totally agree this needs to be main stage. I'm like sitting, laughing, crying, like <laughs> this has been amazing. <laughs> Meditating, thank you. Um, Mike, well, yesterday I went to the food as medicine talk, and I was a little bit shocked that like culture wasn't mentioned. Mm. And so um, being from Oklahoma, being I'm half Mexican, so food as medicine is real and it's ba based in culture and our ancestors. So if you could just touch on, you know, who does medicine from y'all's perspective and Lindsay's. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, so in the Caribbean, we still use food as medicine. I have, we call it fever grass, it's actually lemongrass in my backyard. So when I'm sick, I just go out, cut a few pieces of grass and drink the tea. Um, or we have what sour sup leaves that you can use or guava leaves that you could uh, draw and put in your hair for hair growth. So we still use food as medicine. Castor oil. Yeah, castor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking to patients about castor oil. I mean, 
I have nightmares about castor oil, all right? Um, because it was a regular practice. Before we go back out to school, after July, August vacation, mommy would always give us castor oil to drink so that we're clean before we go back out to school, if you all know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but it is, to me, you can't have, I'm shocked that they didn't talk about culture because mm. in Mexico, in the Caribbean region, in Asia, we, in Brazil, yeah. we still use food as medicine, you know, and it's something that is passed down from generations. Mm. Um, when I was pregnant with my first child, my mom gave me a bush bath, and that is a tradition when you give birth to your first child in the bathtub, there was just leaves of all sorts. And I sat in the water and you would not believe how invigorating that was mm. coming out of the hospital. So we still do. And I'm like, first I was like, mommy, why are you making me sit on in bush? And then <laughs> after when I went in the water, I was like, oh, now I get it. Mm. So. I, that is something I hope that if my children, especially my daughter, ever decides to have children, that I will do for her. Um, so food as medicine cannot happen without a cultural context. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so, last Alex, oh, Alex, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I just, for, for those types of conversations, I was not in that panel uh, discussion yesterday to, to learn and observe. But what I think is a really interesting conversation happening now that is helping to bridge that for people who are not making that connection is biodiversity. As we think about biodiversity and how we grow our food and how it's connected to biodiversity, I am seeing people recognize exactly what Sean said, that what is grown around us mm -hmm. is nurturing nature and it's nurturing us. And so if food is medicine is a foreign concept for people, I think that's a possible opportunity where we can see it become more relevant for our topics of conversation. Okay, all right, last question. Thank you all so much for such an insightful panel. Speak um, up, speak up, speak up. I'm Olivia, I am a member of this Gen Z cohort that June was talking about, <laughs> and I know that we do feel a lot of this pressure to make a lot of change now, and so I'm wondering any advice that you all have for intergenerational inclusivity and how we can have conversations so that there isn't, you know, among all age groups so that there isn't this resentment that I think sometimes comes up of like, we have to fix the problems that other generations caused. I wonder how mm. we can actually work together so it's not this tension. All right, all right, all right. All right, we're ending strong, I like that. Okay. Um, um, I'll, I'll add just real quickly, um, I'm not obviously not in your generation, um, <laughs> but I actually look at my own children and learn from them. Um, I'm not sure if your, your question and is coming from the perspective of what you can learn from uh, other generations, but to, you know, to build on what June has said, that there is a lot that I can learn uh, from the um, up and coming leaders in this, in this space. Uh, there's a lot that I can learn from uh, my children, um, and I'd love to be referred to as hot sauce at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I do a lot of work with young people like yourself. I actually love being surrounded by uh, Gen Zers, young people, children, because the perspective that you bring to the table um, is very unique. And so when you, it is for the generations ahead of you to be more open to be willing to hear your voice because it is, mm. it is important, needs to be heard and, and valued to allow you to share your perspectives and to give you responsibility. Mm. I think oftentimes the older generation, it's either they feel like it's been like this for the last 30 years, it will continue to be so, or I don't trust that you will do it as good as me, so mm. I will micromanage you. Mm. <laughs> I, uh. I will micromanage you because I don't, but that, that is not on you, that's on the person. And so with the intergenerational discussion, it's not so much, uh, it's your generation being open to learn, 
but it's the generations ahead of you also being open to share mm. and to give to create a space for you to make mistakes, to speak up. Because um, I always tell the, any young person, because I have an internship program, I kind of ended it, but I want to restart it again. And I tell them, I say, if there's anything you see me doing that you think can be done better, speak up and let me know. Mm. Um, because it is about the whole, not the one. All right. And I just have last to last add. brief comments, but they're I important. I just have to add. So share, listen with great empathy, vulnerability, and it's for our generation, older Gen X, uh, millennial, uh, a lot of millennials, yeah, <laughs> boomers. It's for us to invest in your worlds. So we can't just listen and sh you know share. We have to actually invest mm -hmm. in the worlds that you are making yourselves ready for. Right. Okay, last question. I promise, yeah. I promise. Um, what are we actively doing on that subject in refectorios in different places in the world? We are creating space and time for that interaction to happen. We lean heavily into the arts and finding a common thread to initiate the discussion. And I think that's what has to happen is we have to create space for those conversations to happen, or to your point, they won't happen. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. Hey, round of applause. I want to. Woo, woo, woo. I want to. I want to thank everyone for embracing the safe and brave space and the courage that it was present in this room, the same courage that we need outside of this room. And remember, you know, what we can do in, in, in my recommendation is we find like-minded people. We build a gang, warriors for social justice. Don't pick, up, don't pick a fight by yourself, come back with some folks. <laughs> you know, and if you see something, say something. All right, everybody have a good day.